Um, so my presentation today is a over is an overview of research that I have been doing for the last. Can you transfer, maybe, to the other? Okay. I hope I don't have to do this manually. I hope it'll work. In any case, it is a an overview of the research that I've been doing for the last. 12 or so years, which started rather innocently. Um, I've been working in the field of branding for almost my entire career, and um, I was asked a question quite innocently by my goddaughter, who was in high school in 2005. And I want to paint the picture of the world for you in 2005. Um, YouTube had just recently launched we, there was no such thing as Facebook or Twitter or any of many of the social media channels we now use. Um, we mostly were on the internet using email and watching porn and playing games. Uh, when the J. Crew catalog came online, our sort of heads exploded at the possibility that we could actually shop online and have it delivered without leaving the house. Um, and so, all of a sudden, in a matter of one year, a brand launched and became the most popular brand on the planet. It actually, in the end of 2005, beginning of 2006, surpassed Google as the most popular brand on the internet, the most visited website on the internet. That's when this research began. So the question that I was asked by my goddaughter in high school at the time was, why is MySpace so popular? Anybody remember MySpace? So she asked me this question. I went to MySpace. I registered. I logged in. I went and did some interface navigation experimentation. Hated it. Couldn't understand why on earth it was so popular. And as someone who was supposed to be an expert in the world of branding, thought that I really better figure out why, and quickly, this brand had become the most popular website on the planet and had surpassed Google in terms of page views that it was getting on a daily basis. And what I realized, when I started to look at why MySpace was so popular, I had to look at the conditions that led to the conditions that led to MySpace being so popular. And MySpace actually began rather innocuously as a data storage site. And it was only about a year or two into their tenure that they turned the site into a social sharing site. Um, and so what I needed to do was some research, because I didn't understand why this somewhat dreadful website was so intriguing to so many people globally. And I did a lot of research in the, in the process. So it's been, believe it or not, almost 12 years, this body of research that I've done. So the good news is that I am going to tell you why MySpace became so popular, scientifically, why it became so popular. The bad news is you might think, well, why do I care? It's been a long time since MySpace was so popular, so really, you know, what are you, what are you telling me? What I'm hoping to be able to show you is why the behavior has actually stuck around. Why are we so addicted to our devices? Why do we live in our devices now? What is that thing that happens to us scientifically, physiologically, emotionally, mentally, that keeps us so compelled in this arena? And then what can we do about it, both good and bad? So I did a lot of research. In the process, I actually wrote two books about a lot of the research. One was called How to Think Like a Great Graphic Designer, wherein I interviewed a lot of really good graphic designers about how they think. And then the other, which came after, was Brand Thinking and Other Noble Pursuits, where I talked to a lot of people in the world of branding about, among many other things, why they thought MySpace had become so popular so quickly. And so, as I said, I had to really understand the conditions that led to the conditions of MySpace even launching. And so it took me down a bit of a rabbit hole of sorts, 
back to sort of the origins of modern branding, which I talk to as being approximately um, the late 1800s, and I'll talk about why in a minute. Um, and at that time, 160 years ago, developing a brand was actually a, a rather simple endeavor. You developed a logo or a label, and that became sort of the paramount, at, paramount attribute of quality or consistency. And consumers at that time were quite readily willing to pay a premium for something that was in a box or in a wrapper or protected from the environment. And in that 160 years, we've gone to this. This is sort of your average supermarket where you have about 40,000 different products. There are over 100 brands now of nationally advertised water. There are 113 brands of contact lens solution. If you go into a Starbucks and you figure it out mathematically between the size, the syrup, the caffeination, various flavors and so forth, mathematicians have actually calculated that you have upwards of 19 million choices in a Starbucks. Um, and if you go into a mall, there are actually 47,000 malls in the United States. You'll see quite a lot of the same stores. You'll see likely a Victoria's Secret and an Old Navy, maybe a Sears. So we're living now in this homogenized place where we can go from store to store, picking out the various brands that we want to pick out. So if you look at the tendency to do this, there's quite a polarizing view. There are some people that believe that our capitalist society is the reason we are a successful society. And then there are others feel that the reason that civilization is doomed is because of this consumerist mentality. But if you deconstruct what even the brands that are against branding are doing, so the no logo contingent and the buy nothing day people and ad busters, what you very quickly find is that they use the very tenets of branding that they are so, so powerfully against. They all have logos, they all have websites. If you go to the ad busters website, you'll see that there are ad busters branded sneakers that they're selling to raise money. So it's not so much whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that I'm really interested in understanding. It's why, as a species, we seem to be compelled to continue to mark and make things. If I deconstruct this behavior into its most fundamental attribute, it's really about marking and making. And so I had to go back into this wormhole of time to understand, OK, here's the sort of advent of modern branding, late 1800s, many of the brands that we still know and love, Coca-Cola, Levi's, and so forth. But I had to actually go back even before that because I was really looking at what are the motivations for the behavior? Where was that behavior actually born? And once I was able to figure out that, I could try to create a timeline that answered the ultimate question here, which was why in 2005 did MySpace become so popular and ultimately translate how we now communicate fundamentally and what seems like is likely going to be forever. So I had to go way back. When I talk about going way back, I had to go back actually 50,000 years ago. And scientifically, the reason I had to go back 50,000 years ago is because this is when our brains reorganized to become the triune brain that we have today. So 50,000 years ago, a genetic mutation occurred. Some scientists believe that it was really, really fast. Others believe it was a slow evolution. And our brains reorganized into what is now called a triune brain three in one. And that is still the construction of our brain today. And scientists either call this the big brain bang or, more poetically, the great leap forward. And I love what that signifies. And the reason they call it the great leap forward is because this is really when the seeds of all of our modern behavior were first born. So this is the, a, a very rudimentary uh, illustration of, of the brain. The old brain is also called the reptilian brain. That's the brain that Seth Godin talks a lot about, the lizard brain, that involuntary part of the brain that keeps us afraid of doing things or is in control of that adrenaline pitch that we feel if we are suddenly confronted with a car in front of us. Um, it also is the part of the brain that controls all of our involuntary actions like digestion and blinking and heartbeat and so forth. It's the oldest and most primitive part of the brain. It sits right up on top 
of the spinal cord. And then above that is the limbic brain or the mammalian brain or the middle brain. It's a part of the brain that we share with all other mammals on the planet. This is the part of the brain that really controls our desperate need to connect with others, to be close to others, to be loved by others. Um, it's also very much where our emotion lies. And then on top of that is the neocortex. Marketers love this part of the brain. It's the part of the brain that controls reason and awareness and language and abstract thinking and will. So this is the current brain. And as I said, um, 50,000 years ago, this is where the seed of all of our basic behavior was born. And our basic behavior, from a scientific perspective, are called cu uh, cultural universals. And these are things that despite religion or race or orientation, any of the things that we use to differentiate who we are from others, is, is, it's all common. We all behave using these different activities, language, art, music, cooking, and self-decoration. And as I said, if I even deconstruct this further, it's really in one of two categories. It's either making or marking. And so this is where 32,000 years ago, we start to document on the walls of caves. So our updates were on walls back then too, but they were the caves of Lascaux, where we first started to document our reality. This is how we viewed our reality, and it was somehow we were compelled to share that publicly with others. And we were able at that point to start to develop stone tools, and this was helpful in gathering more food and protecting ourselves from others, from uh, species that might be uh, against us or after us. We started to create with those stone tools um, environments in which we could go to protect ourselves from an unpredictable environment. We started to array ourselves with makeup. And what's interesting about this beautification motivation is that we didn't use makeup, and this was about 10,000 years ago. Men and women were using makeup back then. Um, it wasn't for uh, seductive purposes. It was to be more beautiful in front of God. And because we started to have this relationship with this higher power, we also needed to designate what that power meant, what that power was. And we started to develop religious symbols to signify that relationship. We started to develop crests and shields to be able to record our lineage. So again, all of this documentation of our place in the world and of our reality. We also started to create flags, and the first flags were actually used on the battlefield. And they were used on the battlefield to be able to signify what side you were on. Because just by looking at another human being, you couldn't necessarily identify whether they were a friend or a foe. And I kind of love what that says about who we really are intrinsically. It was only on the side of the battlefield that you knew where you could retreat to safety. This was before we had the ability to mass manufacture uniforms. So the actual word brand itself was first used in the uh, 1010 AD poem Beowulf, and it literally means to mark or to destroy by fire. And this is where we started to use pine tar on animals to designate ownership. And then for efficacy and speed, we started to use hot iron brands. So brands as we know them, when I talk about modern branding, I really talk about that beginning being at the end of the 18th century. And the reason I use that marker is because that is when brands became legally recognized. Brands became legally recognized on January 1st, 1876 with the advent of the U.S. Trademark Registrations Act. And um, the very first brand in the United States was actually not an American brand. And it was an alcoholic beverage. I think that says a lot about our species. <laughs> the first brand was Bass Ale from the UK. Now I'm going to show you the very first instance of product placement, official product placement. This is the 1882 painting by Manet. And there you can see in the corner, I was told not to move much past this part of the stage. So I'm just going to point. But you can see in the lower corner right over there, that original label, that red triangle, which is actually still the logo today. 
So, so what's happened since then? How, how is this even remotely relevant to why MySpace became so popular in 2005 and why we are now compelled to live in our devices? Well, what I wanted to do in, in an effort to really understand the trajectory of the evolution of modern branding was actually create a timeline. And so I did that. I created this massive timeline where I looked at all of the introduction of all of the major brands that have been launched since 1879 and I organized them and I organized them first I just made the timeline and then I started to see a lot of common denominators and so I ultimately was able to organize that trajectory in about five different waves and so they all what's interesting about the waves is that all of the waves correspond with a big cultural revolution and so it begs the question do we create our brands or do our brands create us and so what I'm going to do now is show you those five waves and then ultimately the big payoff here, spoiler alert, is why MySpace became so popular. Okay, so wave one, brands are guarantees of quality and consistency. And while that might not seem like a big deal now, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, it was a really big deal. We had nowhere near the kind of hygiene that we have now. There were no such thing as plastic bags. There were no such thing as disposable diapers. We had to manually dispose of whatever was in the diaper so that other people wouldn't get sick by touching it or coming into contact with it in any way. So the idea that you could buy something that didn't kill you, didn't harm you, didn't get you sick, was pretty novel. Um, these, uh, the packaged goods were signified premium. You were willing to pay extra for something that was in a canister or in a wrapper or something that was in a can. And these are some of the big brands that were popular at the time. Um, they were also brands that were very reliably safe. In 1908, the FDA first brought out the uh, Drugs and Safety Act, which essentially gave consumers the trust that no product that they bought could legally harm them or in any way deceive them. But it really wasn't until 1920 that this was taken very seriously. A case went all the way to the Supreme Court. 1920, it was the US versus 95 barrels of alleged apple cider vinegar, in which case the Supreme Court then voted and, and made a judgment that no product was allowed to deceive the public. So you were expected that the, the things that you bought would be safe and not harm you in any way. Wave two, brands become anthropomorphized. These are the second wave brands. You have the first wave of brands. All of these first brands were primarily brought to market by people. They were brought to market by people that had a specific value or vision that they wanted to share. So there was a Mr. Kellogg and a, there were the Johnson brothers and a Mr. Proctor and a Mr. lots of Misters, lots of Mr. Gamble. Um, and then what we saw was not unlike what we saw in 1999. Everybody wanted to get into the market. And there was a big brand boom. And what happened at this time was that there really wasn't a way to be able to come up with that many innovative products. I mean, we saw this exactly the same thing happened in 1999. And everything became overinflated. And so what we started to see, because you couldn't differentiate one product from another in actual ingredients, really what is the difference between Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola if you just look at the two glasses filled with the, so with the cola. So what we started to see was personality injected into brands. Characters were developed, and those characters were essentially the first consumer relationship. And so you started to see this, fake characters. People believed that Aunt Jemima was real. People believed that Betty Crocker was real. People believed that Uncle Ben was real, but they weren't. They were entirely made up. But people were so enthralled by Betty Crocker that somebody actually even called General Mills, the owner of Betty Crocker, and asked for her hand in marriage. And Betty Crocker then made an ad about that. That's how much people believed in these characters. So you could relate to and project onto this character. Wave three, brands as self-expressive statements. Here is when, just by the sheer virtue of wearing a specific thing, for me in the 70s it was Levi's jeans, I suddenly became cooler because I had this thing that other people had that was cool for them too. And I thought that if I wore these jeans, I might be cooler than I was. Didn't work, but it gave me hope. 
And so a brand for the first time ever could actually provide status. And these are some of the brands. Anybody know who this guy is? The Marlboro Man. The Marlboro Man has not been advertised in over 20 years. I can still show people this. I could show kids this image and they all know who he is. Nobody that I've ever shown this picture to doesn't know that he's the Marlboro Man. But the Marlboro Man is an entire construct. The Marlboro brand was actually originated in the 1800s in the UK. It was a cigarette that was marketed to women. And it was marketed to women because it had a filter. It was the first cigarette that ever had a filter. And I don't know if you've ever seen anybody smoke with a non-filter cigarette, but there's often a bit of residue that remains on the person's lips. Well, for a woman, a woman in the 18 and 19, 20th century, that was considered déclassé. And so in order to protect the lips, this filter was born. It failed. Went off the market almost as soon as it came out. A hundred years later, in the 1950s, when we start to first get whispers that cigarettes might not actually be that good for people, Marlboro rebrings the cigarette out, relaunches it, because they think the filter might actually protect you. But because they were so concerned about the brand being considered female, if anybody had any history or legacy of the brand, they gave the brand this uber strong man mentality, and that's how the Marlboro Man was originally born. Way four, brands is an experience. We all know about these brands. You anticipate a social uh, and emotional transformation by the sheer virtue of engaging with the brand. If you go into a Starbucks, suddenly you're in a different home. You have this uh, arrangement with the brand well, where it's feeding you various ways of feeling like you are a better person by the sheer virtue of participating with it. So obviously the brands Disney, Apple, Starbucks. So before we get to wave five, I just want to take you back into the science a little bit just to sort of ground my hypothesis. Um, and so about our cultural universals, let's go back to those for a second. Um, our instincts as humans, food, shelter, reproduction, survival. We want to survive. We have this desperate need to survive. But we also, as a species, have a collective tendency. And that collective tendency is to organize ourselves in a pack. We want to be in groups. We feel safer, more secure, more comfortable, more protected. If we know if a spear shoots through into our crowd, the chances are it might hit someone else and not us. And that is deep, deep, deep wiring in us, in our reptilian brain. But we see this everywhere. We see this all over the planet. We see it in fish and ants and birds, dogs, cats monkeys, and people, all sorts of people. We see it in the Amish. We see it in cultural organizations as well. So hippies, hell's angels, yuppies, goth, all using self-decoration to telegraph our values and who we believe we are and we want others to believe as well. But the most pervasive pack organization of all is one that we likely all belong to, and that is the family. And this is a um, American or Western European family, a, a Peru, um, sorry, an Amish family, a Peruvian family. And what's interesting about the nature of our cultural ties to our family, if you go back to the 1950s, John Bowlby and Harry Harlow did a whole series of studies analyzing the child's tie to its mother or primary caretaker. And what was interesting about those studies is that it proved unequivocally that given the choice between having a caretaker and feeling enveloped and taken care of by that caretaker or eating, a baby would always choose being held, comforted, and taken care of. So the baby, instinctually, would rather die of starvation than not be held by a caretaker, not feel that connection with others. And so what has happened is that in order to feel happiest, it has been proven that we feel happiest as a species when, we, when our brains harmoniously resonate with others, when we feel understood. That feeling that you get when you first fall in love, that that person gets you, that's where this comes from. 
you feel that they love you because they fundamentally understand you and your brain resonates harmoniously with others. And this is what we long for. However, there's a population trend that is flying in the face of this need. More and more and more and more people, first in the United States, now globally, are living alone. Individually, alone, single people, households. And what is interesting about the research here is that the statistics show that in 1950, when Harry Harlow and John Dolby did these tests, one in 10 people lived alone. Now we're living in a day and age where less than one in three. So from a statistics point of view, that's staggering. That is staggering in terms of the speed in which this has happened. But it's not just interesting from a technical point of view, one versus 10, one versus three. It's also interesting from an attitudinal perspective because this is what we thought of that single person living alone in 1950. They were an outcast. Now the single person living alone is celebrated. This is an aspirational lifestyle. So where does that leave us? The path to wave five. I just want to take you through how, as a family, we've been connecting over the last 150 years. Wave one, listening to Betty Crocker on the radio, falling in love with her voice. Wave two, sitting, watching uh, black and white television. It took 35 years, 35 years for 150 million consumers to own a black and white television set. And like yesterday, 150 million people bought the new iPhone. Wave three, color television. Wave four, any, another couple of brands that you might remember. Blockbuster, the idea that you got into the car, drove somewhere, bought a movie, brought it back home, watched it, rewound it, drove back to return it. Seems prehistoric. And so I'm going to show you an image now that I, was very similar to what I showed you when I showed you the Marlboro image. You know instantly who it is without any brand even in the purview, and that's this. We all know what she's doing. I could just take a picture of somebody like this, and you'll know what they're doing. So if I look at this from an evolutionary point of view, you've probably seen this slide before, but I really do believe that this is what it's come to. But when it first got to that, and this gets back to what I was saying earlier, what were we doing before MySpace was so popular, before 2005? What, were the, what was the commercial opportunity online? This is what we were doing. We were playing games. We were emailing, buying things from the J. Crew catalog, porn. These were the big markets online. And then six weeks after 9-11, something was launched that changed everything. And that was this. And this was at the time, taken at the time, where that had that you know that I know that you know that I know response to having the white earbuds when everybody was just beginning to understand what that meant. Well, it's so ubiquitous now that you see things like this. So what happens then? From 2001, end of 2001, to the end of 2004, in many circles, anthropologically, sociolo sociologically, physiologically, the iPod was representative of why civilization was doomed. We were now living in an isolation nation. And these were the headlines we saw over and over and over again. And this is a quote from the, in the, the December 2004, one of the, um, an issue of the New York Times, wherein James Katz, a communications professor at Rutgers, attributed the iPod's popularity to a trend in the American culture toward withdrawing from the public sphere or the public culture into one's private space where you can have complete control over your entertainment. The iPod psychologically depopulates social space view. It increases isolation and anime. End of 2004. And then something remarkable happened. In this little social isolated space, we need, as humans, for our brains to harmoniously resonate with others, and we invent a way for our brains to harmoniously resonate with others in that formally depopulated space. And we created new frameworks to connect in those devices, and that is why so quickly MySpace became so popular. 
we were so isolated in that space and have such a deep prehistoric need to be connected that we created a way for us to do that in that environment. And so I'm calling Wave 5 brands limbic brands, brands that facilitate our ability to connect and for our brains to harmoniously relate to others. And so now we can find out exactly what everybody is doing at any given time, what they're eating, who they're sleeping with, who they're not sleeping with, and everything else about them. So brands as connectors. And here are just obviously some of the brands since MySpace. So why do we brand? Why, why do we do this? I think that branding is a profound manifestation now of the human condition wherein we are evolving as a race to create new brands as, as a way to invent, because that's what we do. We continually invent new ways to be able to communicate and converse with others. But what's really interesting, and, and this, is, this has been a continuing and ongoing investigation, and so I keep having to look at what are the new entries, how is this changing, how, how are we responding to the things that are created, and there's this back and forth backlash. You, you even see that with products where in the late 1800s we were very willing to pay a premium for a boxed, wrapped cracker. We're now willing to pay a premium for something that has a very short farm-to-table footprint. So what we're seeing now is a backlash to what happens, again, a very human, very, very basic way of our physiognomy and how it compels us to do certain things. We're starting to see that space that we were harmoniously resonating with others now turn into a comparison. And so whereas before we felt really good reconnecting with all of our high school friends and the people we went to kindergarten with, we are now faced with situations where what we're doing is now comparing. And so that survival of the fittest starts to kick in. And so we see what's happening to Generation Z, which is now being nicknamed Generation D, D for depressed, because if they don't get enough likes on their Instagram photos, they have to take those photos down, otherwise they're ashamed and embarrassed. And so, of course, we get to this. Is social media making your family miserable because we're just jealous and envious of everybody else that supposedly has a great life and ours sucks? I went through a really bad time last fall. And I, was, I went through a, a pretty intense um, bout of depression. And I met somebody that I hadn't seen in quite a while, and she said, how are you doing? And I said, oh, not so good. You know, I'm having blah, blah, all these problems. She said, really? You look fine on Facebook. And I looked at her and I said, everybody looks fine on Facebook. Everybody looks fine. So we're now at a place where even our sense of being appreciated and liked is something that can be manufactured. So what does that mean for brands moving forward? How can you create, how can you design a brand? How can you create what I consider to be the very essence of branding, deliberate differentiation between one brand and another? The key now is you still have to keep people feeling connected. You want people to feel like they're part of a bigger tribe, that they're part of something bigger than themselves. But you have to inspire people to feel okay as is. So the brands that are going to be the popular brands, the brands that people can viscerally and emotionally connect to now are brands as acceptors. Brands not only as connectors, but brands as acceptors. How do you make people feel good just by the sheer virtue of engaging with your brand? It's not enough to have a different form or a different flavor or a different navigation. It's about how do you make a difference in their lives? How do you create a sense of this being something valuable to them? It's not just a value, it's being valuable. And then lastly, to make a difference in their lives. So I'm out of time. I hope that this was helpful. Um, it's been a real honor being here. As I said last year at this time, I was going through a really hard time and I came to the conference. And so to think now that I'm back here and talking to you all is just a real, real gift for me. Thank you.